Thank you very much to all the organizers who have been putting this incredible event together. I apologize for speaking in English because my Portuguese is very, very limited. <laughs> I hope the translation is working for those who are using the translation. And um, I'm very happy to be here in Sao Paulo again after 20 years. The last time was 20 years ago. And uh, at that time, I was mostly involved with the Rolfing method. But uh, in the last 10, 12 years, I have changed my emphasis more time towards the scientific exploration of fascia. But I was inspired by uh, the, the teaching that Rolfers talk every day about fascia. And 20 years ago, that was ridiculous in the eyes of many other people. And basically, I'm here to celebrate with you not only 30 years of the Brazilian Rolfing Association, but also the flourishing that the Rolfing community has taken here in Brazil, but also worldwide. And for my part, I'm here to celebrate the flourishing that the unique insights from Ida Rolf, but she was not alone, uh, but she was one of the pioneers uh, that came from outside of mainstream medicine that pointed to fascia as a very important tissue for human health, for human pathologies, and for therapeutic improvements. So a lot has changed in the last 20 years, and in this first talk, I will have the pleasure to cover some of the aspects of what has changed. As Luis Fernando, from his um, MD, medical doctor perspective, already shared, in conventional anatomy, fascia is mostly thrown away into these temporary waste baskets in the classical approach of human anatomy. And the importance of fascia can be compared with, with the limited importance that you give to the wrapping of a Christmas present in relationship to the present. Usually, you throw the wrapping away but you keep the present. And that was, for many decades, even for several centuries, the classical, not in complementary medicine, Ida Rolf, Andrew Taylor Still, Elizabeth Dicke, so there were several people outside of mainstream medicine who already pointed at the wrapping and said, this is not just wrapping. But in conventional, in mainstream med uh, Western medicine, it has been largely uh, overlooked and neglected. There were several reasons for it. Uh, first of all, you could not measure it very exactly. For the bones, we had x-rays early on. So if you had a debate, if the position of the atlas is rotated to the right or the left, and, and we couldn't agree, you could take an x-ray, and then you could learn from it. With the muscles, very early on, we had EMG, electromyography, and then for a fraction of a second, you can determine at which phase of the walking cycle the iliacus is active, the quadratus is active, the hamstrings are active, and then the researchers like it if they have something exact where they can learn on. But in fascia, you had it feel stiff, or I feel resistance here, and that is satisfying to, to clinicians because you trust your hands. But it's not satisfying if you have subjective measurement to academic research. One reason was that the ultrasound refinement uh, was not sharp enough to measure differences below one millimeter. But if the average thickness of fascia is one millimeter or less, and that's, that's happening almost everywhere in the fascia profunda around the body. On the lateral side, at the iliotibial tract, it's one and a half millimeter thick. So if you find a stiffness and an increase in, in thickness, they tend to go together, not always. Uh, it was hard to quantify if the thickness is uh, increased 20%. But now, with ultrasound, for example, you can measure it. And that was one of the reasons why in the first uh, Fascia Research Congress, 2007 at Harvard Medical School, there was such an excitement there, because finally we can measure this, uh, this tissue. Another reason was uh, 
we managed to cut the muscular system into 500 separate muscles. Sometimes that was very easy, sometimes it was a bit arbitrary, but almost everybody followed the system. And you can have a little discussion whether the iliopsoas is one muscle or two muscles, but the books tend to agree with each other. Now, if you want to look at the books about fascia, how many pieces of fascia do we have? Is there a lumbar fascia, or is it called lumbar dorsal fascia? Where does it start, where does it end? After 10 minutes, you throw the books away because you decide, I come back when you have found agreement. Because if you want mental clarity, where you have isolated parts that you can count, and you give them names, and then you discuss their relationship, this is what the male scientific Western mind loves. If, if somebody tells you there are five muscles on the rotator cuff, and three of them do this, two of them do this, this is aesthetically pleasing for me. But you don't have that advantage when you study the fascial system. Because one person cuts it into three layers, another person cuts it into two layers. So that was another reason. Now we have descriptive models where you can describe something in precision without cutting it arbitrarily into fragmented parts. But these descriptive models were not so much available 20, 30 years ago. So, since the 2007 Congress, there has been a steep increase in academic articles, in research articles, on this Cinderella tissue of orthopedic medicine. Also, the journal Science, which is number one in academic research, at least in North America, opened our doors. Without that article, this room would be very, very small. It would be still some osteopaths, some connective tissue therapists, some strange thinkers who would be sitting here. But this uh, two-page article in the science magazine opened our doors. It was a very positive article about this first Congress, but also about a new field of interdisciplinary research. That means medical doctors, veterinary anatomists, biomechanical researchers, uh, many matrix biologists are working together to understand the function of this formerly uh, ne uh, neglected tissue. So, th so this article basically has, has opened uh, the perspective. One of the difficulties we face when we look at fascia from so many disciplinary perspectives is the question of terminology. Uh, for example, in the previous edition of the Terminologia Anatomica, it was called Nomina Anatom uh, An Anatomica, and also in the previous edition of Gray's Anatomy, up to two years ago, the subcutaneous connective tissue, so that is the skin. Here you have the fascia profunda, which is the picture I've shown you before. So this is a, a dense layer, usually not very much transparent. The subcutaneous connective tissue, which has a lot of fat, it was very unclear until today, or even up to today, whether you call that fascia or whether you call it loose connective tissue. And uh, in the current uh, Terminologia Anatomica, they try to come to clarity and they propose not to have superficial fascia at all. They said there is no superficial fascia. If you have camper fascia, don't call it camper fascia. You can call it tela subcutanea camperitidis. So that is one of the problems that you're facing there. In the Italian anatomy, there has been a tradition only to look at the membranous layer or layers within the subcutaneous connective tissue and to call them superficial fascia. And Calasteco, one of the pioneers in anatomy, in fascial anatomy, she proposed, and maybe she will get agreement for that, that we do take over the Italian anatomy, where only the membranous sheet, which in the trunk, usually it is easy to see. So if you take ultrasound and you look at the superficial fascia, there is usually an adipose layer here, there is also an adipose layer here, and then there is one 
membrane is layer in between. And if you look at that picture, that is very pleasing and convincing. And if you look in the trunk, you find that to be true at 80% of the locations. However, when you look with ultrasound at the limbs, there are three layers, three and a half layers, two and three quarter layers, and you will have a, the same difficulty again. Which layer you call superficial fascia and which one you include into the adipose and, and only connective tissue that you have in there. So uh, one difficulty that we had with the new proposal from Terminologia Anatomica also at the 2007 Congress, and the difficulty you have been facing when you prepared for this Congress and have been looking at fascia, uh, is it is of course a very big advantage if you have a precise definition. And the Terminologia Anatomica suggested only membranous layers of dense connective tissue that you can cut with a naked knife, uh, with, with a knife, with a naked eye, where you don't need a microscope for it. And they call it irregular connective tissue. However, when you look at some of these irregular connective tissue, like the plantar fascia, you see that it's arranged in a lattice-like, in a crisscross diagonal arrangement, often with a very precise angle. For example, the muscular envelopes have are often an angle of 77 degree, and they call that irregular arrangement. So that already is a slight weakness with a new definition from the Terminologia Anatomica. So maybe what they mean is more than one direction they call irregular. So if you have two directions or more, then it is called a proper fascia. An upper neurosis uh, for them is not proper fascia because it is unidirectional. So that is aesthetically pleasing because you can say this is fascia, this is upper neurosis. And you don't have wishy washy meta foo foo. You, ha you have a clear definition what are fascial tissues and what not. And that has a, a big advantage. However, when you have a clear definition, it may also sometimes have a disadvantage. For example, there was a very brilliant article written in the um, Journal of Anatomy, which is still number one, and since the Harvard Congress, there are again articles, macroscopic anatomy articles on fascia. Before, there was hardly anything on it. And one of the best articles written about the iliotibial tract pointed out that that is a very unique structure. Only Homo sapiens has a iliotibial band going from above the pelvis to below the knee. So it is, it's, it's, it is very unique. So it's the longest multidirectional uh, fibrous band that we have. And we, you know that uh, regular runners, this is one of the most common complaints they have. So not if you go running two or three times a week, but if you go running more than four or five times a week, you have a higher likelihood of getting myofascial pain than a couch potato. This is not, uh, so, so, so this is uh, not what you want, but that is happening. And one of the reasons why regular runners have myofascial pain is called the runner's knee, the IT band syndrome, where they have a lot of pain there. And in this article, they wanted to understand why the pain is created there if you do a lot of high-impact loading, of course, where you load this iliotibial band. However, when you look at this picture, you see that they cut one piece away, which often is included in other anatomy books as part of the iliotibial tract. Do you see a part missing here that you would have expected, particularly if you if you work with runners and athletes. It is the stiffest, the strongest part of the iliotibial tract that they cut away. I'll help you a little bit. If you look at the IT band at Natter, you see there is a very thick attachment at the iliac crest. It uh, had, uh, had no special name until recently, uh, it's a nameless part, now we call it the ligamentous part. 
And you can see how strong it pulls on the iliac crest because normally the iliac crest is twice as thick where this nameless part of the iliotibial tract attaches because of the strong pull of that fascia. Not because of muscular force, because the tensor fascia lata attaches much more forward than the gluteus maximus behind. So you have to ask yourself, why did they cut this very strong part uh, away? And I know the researchers, and they are very careful. They are very clever people. They are some of the best anatomists that I have met. And I asked them for it, and I got a very interesting answer. They said, we wanted to be precise in our terminology. And for the Journal of Anatomy, it is best if you follow the highest uh, nomenclature that exists in the field of anatomy, which is the Terminologia Anatomica. And in the Terminologia Anatomica, an aponeurosis is not the same. It's a tendon sheet with, uni with parallel fibers as fascia. So we needed to decide for this article if the subject of this article, the IT band, is proper fascia, so we can call it fascia, or whether we have to call it an aponeurosis. It cannot be both. So we need to decide. And for understandable reasons, they made uh, the difficult decision, we call it an aponeurosis. Uh, because otherwise, the tensor fascia lata would have no function. So I can understand. And every reviewer would have said, that is very nice. You have written very nice in academic precision. However, when you cut out the, the upper part here, because that is not an ap aponeurosis. Aponeurosis is a connection from red colored muscle fibers into a tendinous, in, in, into a connective tissue membrane. And this is the only part, or, or one of the main parts, uh, where it's not an aponeurosis. So if you define the IT band is an aponeurosis, you have to cut away the parts that are not included in your definition. That is clear academical reasoning. Everybody would say, very nice, German precision at work. We give you five points in terms of academic precision. However, in terms of clinical significance, I would give you minus five points. Because if you cut the most important force transmitting element out of that membranous connective tissue sheet, and then you say, how can a runner's knee be influenced? Where should I work with it? You have very little uh, reliability, uh, or you have ver very, very little validity in that. So that is one of the examples why at the 2007 Congress and since then, many people who look at the functional importance of fascia tended to use a more wider nomenclature and, uh, and definition in looking at fascia. Because sometimes if you, if you use a very fragmented, uh, detailed uh, definition, your descriptions are less valid. So at the last Fascia Congress, it was almost a split between the mixers and between the precision people there. But we managed to come to a temporary agreement where we said if you want to communicate with anatomists, if you want to predict what you see in the microscope in terms of a microscopic view of the tissue, we recommend you follow the most strict uh, recent definition of terminology anatomica, at least until they may change it. But that is the most recent definition, and then you would have to do it like Benjamin and Mills have been doing it. Then the IT band is an aponeurosis because you have, a, so, so, so it would not be proper fascia. So that would be the anatomical usage. However, and I would recommend you use that when you talk with medical doctors, and you call that, that is proper fascia. However, when you look at functional importance of fascia, there was a recent uh, recommendation by the nomenclature committee, and it took us two years with the Delphi process to get a temporary agreement on that. We suggest 
that you also describe the fascial system, and that includes tendon sheets, aponeurosis, it includes joint capsules, it includes even ligaments as an intramuscular connective tissue too. So because these tissues are seen as parts of a body-wide tension-specialized connective tissue system. So for lay people, fascia is the same as what they call connective tissue. For doctors, not, because for medical doctors and anatomists, bone is connective tissue, but that is not tension-specialized. So cartilage and bone is connective tissue for a medical doctor, but soft connective tissues, we can all look at being part of the fascial system. And whether you call uh, one portion of the IT band an aponeurosis, whether you call it a ligament, for example, the IT band becomes part of the collateral ligament, it becomes even part of the knee joint capsule, whether you call one millimeter a ligament or joint capsule, or whether you call it proper fascia, it depends on the specialization, on the loading history of this part of the fascial network. So the IT band, you are not born with it. it you had an envelope around your thigh with uh, bidirectional uh, fibers, and when you get up on your feet and you load your body weight and one feet at a time, then the lateral side gets denser and denser and the fibers running vertically down, they get thicker and thicker. But if you get injured and, you and return to a quadruped locomotion or in a wheelchair, your IT band will, will start to uh, disappear gradually. So it means you have a body-wide tensional network and that specializes in terms of fiber arrangement but also in terms of density to the local loading history. And that is now the new concept. So if you talk with people who look at functional importance of fascia in terms of force transmission but also in terms of wound healing, the wound healing, the myofibroblast, gives a shit whether you call it ligament or joint capsule or aponeurosis. It takes the fascia and glues it together. So for wound healing, but also for proprioception that I will look at, and for myofascial pain, all these fibrous collagenous, tensionally loaded connective tissues are all part of one body-wide system. And that's the terminology that we recommend whenever you look at functional properties of the connective tissue system. A big surprise in mainstream medicine and also for us Rolfus, we were aware of the mechanical importance of this body-wide fascial network in, in, uh, for posture organization, for movement restrictions, etc. is the dense innovation of this wrapping of your Christmas present. And uh, this is uh, a more recent histological section from Professor Menze, where he identified clear specialized nociceptors in the human lumbar fascia. So he used an antibody that stains only substance P positive nerve endings P like pain, so these are free nerve endings that have no other known function than to wait for an excuse to signal potential tissue threat, what is called nociception, to the central nervous system. So it means fascia can be a source of myofascial pain, and that is coming more and more now into, uh, into the uh, pain field. In sports science also, when you look at what is called DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, that you get one or two days with the apex of the pain after usually eccentric loading. So in, if, you, uh, if you do uphill running, you don't get DOMS so much, but in downhill, even hiking, you get it. And the recent theory is that you do have some tissue damage, but we, it's not very clear where the damage is. They assume it's in the muscle fibers themselves at the set discs, but that is still uh, doubtful 
because the set disc fragments in the muscle fibers have only been shown in electrical muscle stimulation, which is beyond physiological loading. In physiological loading, these fragments or these injuries have not been clarified. But that's the best explanation we have, that you have injuries somewhere in the muscle or in the intramuscular connective tissue. The injury does not hurt as much, otherwise the pain should be the most strong when you run. But it is the repair in which you have an edema as part of the inflammatory wound uh, repair, there is an increase of ground substance water and that has an apex one or two days uh, after the injury. And then it is the fluid pressure on fluid sensitive nerve endings in the intramuscular connective tissue that signals you the DOM. So that is the current state of everybody who has studied exercise science. However, we don't know where is the location of these pressure-sensitive nerve endings? So where is the DOMS coming from? And there have been two new studies, and that's the later one, uh, where they, in this study, they had people lower a weight a thousand times or a few hundred times, and then you come, here you come with an electrical needle, and you give them a, a minute, a very low electrical uh, stimulation, and you ask them, is this painful? And on the arm that did concentric contractions, it's not very painful. Only on the arm where you have DOMS, where you have delayed onset muscle soreness. However, the painful region is in the epimuseum. In the, so this is the subcutaneous connective tissue that uh, Terminologia Anatomica does not acknowledge as superficial fascia, so you can continue to call it uh, uh, subcutaneous connective tissue. This is the fascial envelope of the biceps. So if you stimulate the fascial envelope, the epimuseum, it is highly sensitive on the DOMS arm, not on the other. However, when you go into the muscle itself, it is not very sensitive. There is almost no difference between the DOMS arm and the other arm. And this is very elegant. On the arm, you go to the second muscle that has the same elbow flexing function to the brachialis, and you get exactly the same. So the fascial envelope is sensitized. The belly, the inside of the muscle, is not sensitized. So next time you have delayed onset muscle soreness, ask yourself, where is the center of the pain? Is it in the skin? Is it in the bone? Is it in the inside of the muscle? Is it on the muscular envelope? According to the research, it should be more the muscular envelope rather than the inside of the muscle. We don't know uh, why the muscular envelope is so sensitive. It could be that you have injuries there. There is another explanation is that the sensitive nerve endings in fascia are like a watchdog, an alarm dog. If another family member gets angry or irritated or violated, they become hypersensitive. That has been shown also by the Menzer group. If you inflame, not the fascia, but you inflame the erector spinae, they only did it in rats, gladly. So you, so you injure the muscle, and then on the next day, you shake hands with both of them, so you do a minor manipulation, then the muscle is not hypersensitive, but his sister, the fascia, she screams at you, don't hurt me so much, you bloody bastard, and you haven't done any injury to her. So be careful when you say the origin of the pain is also where the injury is. You can only say delayed onset muscle soreness has the origin in the fascial envelope. But whether the injury is happening there or whether the injury is happening on intramuscular connective tissue, we don't know yet. But it already points in an amazing direction that many myofascial pain uh, may be originated more from the fascial envelope than from deeper structures. The most important uh, topic that will be facing you probably in the next few years is 
those 80 to 85 percent of cases of low back pain that are called idiopathic. You should know that disc problems, disc pathologies, even if they get uh, into surgery, in most cases they are not the cause and the origin of the low back pain. Uh, they are because many people have the same pathologies without any pain. So 80 to 85 percent of low back pain, we don't know where it comes from. And there is now recent indication, this is one of the, here I have the very nice, uh, where is my cursor? So on the left side, you see the lumbar fascia doing a passive forward bending motion. So Helen Lajewa, she put healthy people on a chiropractic table, and then with a slow speed, she lowered the trunk 15 degrees downward so that you would get 15 degrees lumbar flexion just above the iliac crest. And then she put the ultrasound head, and here you see the subcutaneous connective tissue, and there is almost no movement between the skin and subcutaneous connective tissue and the ultrasound head. And this is the lumbar dorsal fascia, and you can see clearly there are two layers, a superficial layer and a thinner second layer here. And here you have the muscular tissue. And you see there is a lot of, you could call it sliding, but the better term is shearing, because they are, there is a fibular connection between them. And you can see in healthy people, there is a lot of lateral shearing motion between the envelope and between the muscle underneath. In chronic low back pain people, you see there is a tendency to be thicker, but that is not significant when you look at women alone. It is significant when you put a man and women together. It is also significant in the man group, but when you look at women alone as a subgroup, it's no longer significant, the increase in sickness. So it means there is a small subgroup of women in which the lumbar dorsal fascia got less thick. But in both groups, and that is very unique, there is a restricted shearing motion here. So you could say you have an increased adherence between the muscular envelope and the muscle that it is uh, enveloping. Now, you could say that's related to injury because then you have scarring and you have increased adhesions between the layers. However, it could be also related to lack of mobility, that the back pain is generated from somewhere else, maybe from the facet joints, maybe from the disc, not from the muscular envelope, but because of the pain, you move less, you avoid lumbar flexion when you untie your shoes. And if you do that for several months, this is chronic low back pain, so it's usually more than three months, uh, then you may have adhesion, not because of the local injury, but because of the lack of movement there. So does it matter for you as a therapist? Yes, it would be nice to know it. Should you treat it anyway? Yes, you should treat it anyway, even if the adherence is not the cause of the pain. It may have been that the original cause of the pain three months ago was in the facet joint. And since then, you have fear of movement, you have a pain memory there, and your lumbar fascia is glued together, and that leads to a loss of proprioception. Because if you have a stretch sensor between the fascia and the muscle, and there is no movement happening, you can meditate for hours. You will, not have, uh, you will not feel whether your lower back is in a low dosis or it's in a neutral spine because your proprioceptive nerve endings have no information. So my recommendation is whether, is whether the adherence that you have in chronic low back pain is the historical origin uh, of the pain or related to it, or whether it's only the secondary uh, adaptation, it would be good to increase the shearing motion anyway in order to foster the proprioception that you have there. Helen Lorge, where she now added a more recent study, where she wanted to see which of the two factors is more potent for reducing, uh, uh, for increasing the adherence of and reducing the shearing motion. 
So in some pigs, she did a very limited uh, injury at their back and uh, at the subcutaneous connective tissue and then saw that the injury reduced the shearing motion significant after time. However, she also took some of them where she didn't injure them, but she put a hobble there, a restriction for the trunk and leg movement, in which she forced them to move like an injured pig for several weeks. And you can see that the movement restriction with the hobble has the same potency, negative potency, on restricting shearing motions. However, when you have both, when you have local injury and you have movement restrictions, you get a much increased uh, effect of it. So that means for movement therapists, it means for manual therapists, better treat both in low back pain. Treat the local injury, the scarring, if it is there, uh, but also treat the movement restriction, because both of them are important factors uh, in, in, in the uh, morphological change that you have there. Some of you know, and I've see, uh, shown it before, that the lumbar dorsal fascia attaching at the spinous processes of the spine has been separated by Andre Fleming and his colleagues more than 10 years ago into two layers. So the first layer you could call an aponeurosis of the lumbar dorsal fascia because it's mainly uh, shaped by limb muscles, by the latissimus dorsi and uh, by the gluteus maximus. And many of the fibers are crossing. There are even some fibers who are crossing uh, behind L4 and L5 without a firm attachment at the spine. And of course, that is a very different force transmission, which means for a healthy back, for fascia-oriented uh, back exercises, please include limb movement. Don't follow the direction uh, uh, of the MedX uh, back strengthening machines where they used a lot of intelligence and machines to isolate the limbs away and only get the autochtonic uh, back musculature. That way you would miss potential adhesions and other pathologies in the first layer of the lumbar fascia that is strongly associated with arm movement and with hip joint movement. However, this is an old picture from Rauber Kopsch, one of the er earliest anatomy books. So if your grandfather has been a medical doctor and he dies and he leaves a castle and a lot of property and your, uh, and your brothers and sisters are fighting about the heritage, have a look at his bookshelf. If there are some old anatomy books where you have the transparent uh, pages between the color pages, they may become worth thousands and millions because these old anatomy books, they had much more white tissue and much more fascia precision in it. And the Steckos and other people are now buying out these old anatomy books because they, at that time, they have been emphasizing at it. So here you see, this is the first layer and you can peel it off. You can peel it off with the blunt side of a knife. So you don't need the sharp side of it. But of course, they are not sliding. There is not just water in between. There is a loose fibrillar connection between the first layer and the second layer. But similar like peeling an orange, you can separate them if you do it slowly, the first layer from the second layer. And the second layer of this fascia is basically the envelope around the erector spinae. So there are hardly any fibers that go from the right side to the left side. And it continues very strongly, not shown here, into the nucleal fascia. So there the head position of the client is very important. And, uh, and we will have uh, Sergio Fonseca lecture also on that tomorrow. Uh, many anatomical research in the last years have shown that the biceps femoris, a hamstring muscle, 30% uh, on average of its fibers do not have the origin where you learned it in the books at the ischial tuberosity. They say goodbye ischial tuberosity. I go directly, I continue, and I insert into the sacrotuberous ligament. 
So you could look at the sacrotubulus ligament as a tendon of the biceps femoris of the, of the long head. And that is the direct connection in terms of force transmission to the second layer that you have there. So uh, I, in a minute I will look at certain yoga positions, at certain myofascial treatment positions. How do you position the client? How do you position yourself in order to open and get potential wrinkles opened to stretch the first layer? And how do you position the client or yourself when you want to address the second layer? Before I go there, let me introduce you to the third layer, how I call it. And that is attaching to the transverse processes. I have not known much about it outside of the books because it's very difficult to palpate in my clients. Also, you need long needles <laughs> to get to it. So until recently, in Western anatomy, we did not know much about the third layer. Uh, Frank Willard, the leading anatomist in, uh, in the osteopathic field, together with Andre Fleming, they spent four years to now look at the third layer. And I think this is very valuable, what they reported to us, and maybe inspiring for our movement and, uh, and manual therapy practice. This third layer is twice as thick as both layers, first layer and second layer together. So that makes it very likely that in terms of trunk stability, whether you can lift your daughter up and put her on your shoulders at the age of two or at the age of eight or 10, whether you can do that or whether one day you say, uh, I'm not strong enough for you, <laughs> that this third layer may be more important than at least any unique layer of the first and the second layer. And then we have to ask which muscles are strengthening, are loading, uh, are pulling on that third layer. And you see it's basically pulled by the lateral belly wall. So you have the oblique external, the oblique internal, and then it is a very holy muscle, at least for the Pilates teacher, the transverse abdominis. Also in yoga, it is highly associated with core stability in the Mula Bandha because there is a lot of very good research, muscular research so far, not so much fascial research, uh, how the transverse abdominis is very much linked to low back stability. As soon as, for example, you have low back pain, even if it is accidentally, if you inject hypertonic saline solution, the transverse abdominis and the multifidus, they go into uh, lack of activity immediately. So there is a very unique neuromuscular control and importance of low back stability of the transverse abdominis. But when I would have asked you which joint is the transverse abdominis moving, if I ask you about which joint is the gluteus maximus moving, you would say the hip joint. If I ask you about the pec major, you would say the shoulder joint. And if I ask you whether it's a flexor or extensor about the gluteus maximus, you have a clear answer. If I ask you about the transverse abdominis, which muscle is it moving, uh, which joint, and is it a flexor or extensor, you say no, uh, it's different. It is a fascial membrane tightener. It is not a skeleton joint mover like um, most of the other muscles. And that is very important now. If you have been working with core stability, if you have been working with great success to activate a dormant and inactive transversus abdominis, please look at its continuation into the fascia. And then it is very helpful to see that normally most of the force goes into the third layer, not into the second or into the first layer. And then it is very important to learn that there is a new triangular column that goes from the iliac crest at least to the lower ribs. It used to be called the lateral raphe with PH and it was seen as a letter V, but now it's been seen as a triangle and there are lots of nerves in it, but we don't know yet which nerves or, or what the function of these nerves is. And in a healthy person, 
if you lift a weight uh, that is not very challenging to you, then this triangular space stays where it is, and most of the force of the transverse abdominis goes to the transverse process. However, when you lift a heavier load, let's say 10 kilograms, or I throw a medicine ball towards you, and a fraction before your hands are catching it, you increase the tonus in the transverse abdominis, then you pre-activate the erector spinae in such a way that they get bulkier, so that they increase their diameter, and that shifts this triangular space one centimeter approximately towards the spinous process, and when you then catch the medicine ball, about half of the tension goes to the transverse process, and the other half goes to the spinous process, which is, of course, much more injury uh, 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 resistant than if you transmit only at one point uh, into the skeleton. An interesting feature, I'll show you this very nice uh, video clip from Serge Krakowetsky at the first Fascia Congress is, if you want to understand the function of the transverse abdominis, you need to look at the geometry of the fascial layer that transmits the tension to either the spinous process or to the transverse process. Let me see, yes. As the lower bundle fascia has an interesting structure here, and the collagen fibers, you can see, are linked this way. This is a lateral raphe. And when you tighten the transversus abdominis, what happens is that you bring the tip of the transverse processes closer together. Now, Poisson is a French engineer uh, 150 years ago, determined what he called the ratio of how much travel you have here versus how much travel you have here. And the best tissue have a Poisson ratio of one, which is one inch here will generate one inch there. The fascia has a Poisson ratio of one. This is the ultimate in efficiency. And this is an example which I did to show you how contraction of transverses extends the spine. Because what bothered me was, when you have a weightlifter, he fires his abdominals. Don't tell me he fires the abdominals to go down. It would make sense. He fires his abdominals because there is a gearbox called the fascia that brings him in reverse. Okay. So, uh, if your lumbar fascia is in a two-directional uh, association like that, then activation of the transverse abdominis can pull L1 and L4 together. So it will be a trunk extensor. It is not the, so a belly wall, so if you lift uh, a barbell in sports, you would want, I would have uh, expected, let go of your belly when you're lifting a weight with your erector spinae. But now looking at this new architecture, I would say let go of your rectus abdominis, but activate, tighten your transverse abdominis if your lumbar fascia has the right geometry. If your lumbar fascia is a multidirectional piece of felt tissue where the fibers go in any direction, if it's not in a crisscross lattice like arrangement, then better let go of your belly. So it means you need muscular control, you need a nervous system that has access to the motor units in the muscle, but the muscle is useless if it cannot transmit with the right geometry in the, in the fascial membrane that you have there. So uh, this is a very nice uh, model that now several people have taken over. Uh, for a healthy back, if you want to avoid uh, ad adjacent layers to glue together in your couch potato life, you should get a sliding end range tensional loading at least once a week. That's what, 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 what most people suggest. Otherwise, they start adhering with each other. And then you would have, for example, the squatting position would be ideal, uh, or the prayer position, 
uh, or here the prayer position. So if you're Muslim and you go in the prayer position once a week, you may not need the first roughing session where, where we treat the people because there is enough sliding and cheering between the layers. Of course, you do need it because there are more contents than just these two layers there. Uh, similar, if you do the plow position, that would be ideal uh, for the second layer of the lumbar fascia. And then any, anything in which you, you're either your transverse abdominus is activated or in which you go in a strong side bending because then this triangular column is moved in relationship to its environment. That would be the proposed uh, client positioning if you look at this third layer. These three layers, two of them are highly associated to the anatomy trains proposed by our Rolfer colleague Thomas Myers. And he has made a huge contribution to the whole field of sports, yoga, pilates, and musculoskeletal medicine by coming from his intuitive insights. He didn't have quantitative research when he developed it. Uh, about force continuities in the myofascial net. And he has also been, in the last years, been able to dissect the continuity. For example, the continuity of the superficial backline. There has now been strong emphasis to show he was right. There is a lot of force transmission across the sacral tuberous ligament. He was not the first one, but he put it into the most uh, uh, convincing pictures and system here. Uh, however, it was not based on quantitative research, and that has now been done by my colleague in Germany, Jan Wilke. So he looked at cadaver studies, and he also added some quantitative cadaver studies. If you pull on a membrane here, how much force transmission is to the right shoulder, and how much force transmission do you have to the left shoulder, and you can quantify. Your guru says it goes to the right shoulder. My guru says it goes to the left shoulder. And then you find an exercise to convince the audience, welcome to physical therapy of the last century, uh, where you can argue and who has the better stories is more convincing. But it was not based on quantitative research. Now, based on quantitative research related to passive force transmission, not active force transmissions, which muscles like to fire together because they are associated in the somatomotor cortex, he showed that, indeed, many of Tom Meyer's force transmission clients have a very solid force transmission. For example, that would be the first layer of the lumbar fascia. That would be the second layer of the lumbar fascia. However, my favorite spiral line, I loved it. It existed before Tom Myers. He, he took it over from Raymond Dart, who had been developing it. But Tom Myers said maybe it continues further. So he went up from the shoulder blade on the back and ended up on the right ear because he didn't stop at the left scapula. So he continued with the rhomboid and the rhomboid fascial envelope and then he continued with a splenius capitis. So a wonderful model, and he took it also into the legs. However, based on cadaver studies, there is no passive force transmission along the spiral line below the pelvis. So if you have been preaching to your clients, put your kinesio tape exactly in the position of Tomaya's uh, force transmission lines, you may need to want to reconsider it. Uh, there may be, it's, it may be a nice model, it may be stimulating your, your, your brain, but it's not based on passive functional force transmission within that system. So I'm just sharing some of the later developments, and we will hear from Tom Myers also tomorrow. I really appreciate how generous he has uh, 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 accepted these uh, contradictory and confirmative findings from the anatomy research. I hope this is also new to some of you, how uh, estrogen is influencing as a female hormone the stiffness uh, of connective tissue. Those of you who are in sports uh, medicine, you know that particularly in soccer but also in volleyball, there is an, a lot of cruciate uh, ligament injury in, in, in female athletes. 
and the likelihood of a cruciate injury is six to eight times higher on the days of the ovulation. So that has been known. Uh, also, if an older woman takes estrogen re replacement therapy, it makes her connective tissue a little bit softer and she will be more likely to injury. Uh, so everybody thought that estrogen is influencing the collagen production of the fibroblasts. However, the research that has been done in Copenhagen was quite paradox because estrogen increases collagen production, but at the same time it makes the tissue weaker. How does that get together? And that has finally been solved. So here you see uh, with uh, in, uh, increased estrogen, older women who are taking estrogen replacement therapy, you have more collagen type 1 fiber, fiber bundles but they are smaller. And this would be people who have uh, average estrogen, the women. And you see you have less fiber bundles. And, uh, the, and I would have expected a rope with more strands in it to be tighter than a rope with less strands in it. However, the tightness is not so much influenced by the cross-sectional diameter of collagen type 1, but by the quantity of these red colored crosslinks. And you see that here in a low estrogen sample, the, uh, there is more total number of red crosslinks as compared with here. Because the crosslinks are usually only within, they are not between the fiber bundles. Now, these are the enzymatic crosslinks, lysyl oxidase. Uh, uh, crosslinks, and there is a very, uh, I, I will uh, look at them tomorrow when we look at the function of sports in it. So you can build them up with sports, and they seem to be the driving factor for the, for the estrogen induced weak uh, softness that you have in the, in, the, in the connective tissue. Let me come, no, actually, I have enough time to look at the pH also. So we are looking now at how biochemical factors are influencing the stiffness and the uh, architecture of connective tissue. We know that uh, estrogen has a tendency to make it weaker. There have been suspicions all the time that an acidic environment may make the connective tissue stiffer, so the opposite of that. And the only reliable research that I was aware of came from the group in Bradford University, and I happen to work there actually, so I know that they work very properly, and they have been taking fresh pieces of rat fascia, put them in an organ bars, and then get them with various chemical substances to contract, and you measure the contractile strengths. And then they did something that we were not able to do at Ulm University, where they didn't change the chemical constitution. So, for example, with um, uh, mepiramin, that is a uh, antihistamine, um, uh, or with, with other histamine-associated substances, you can get the fascia to contract. So you keep the same dosage, but you change the PA in the organ bars. And they were able to show in an acidic organ bars environment the same dosage leads to a stronger contraction power. So in an organ bars that has been shown. But your fascia is quite different than in an organ bars. So I was very careful to extrapolate that and say if you have too much acidic nutrition, your fascia will be stiffer. However, there has now been more recent research, not in organ bars, but in living humans. In lung fibrosis, they showed that the pH has a strong influence on the differentiation of myofibroblasts out of normal fibroblasts. So it means in an acidic environment, the factor which is there, TGF beta, if you then have lactic acid additionally increase the acidity in the connective tissue of the lung, then you have a lot of myofibroblasts, and they make a strong contracture. However, when you have the same doses of TGF, which is an injury repair substance, you can call it, 
but you neutralize the effect of the lactic acid, then you don't have as many myofibroblasts and you don't have the lung fibrosis in such a strong contracture. So it means now we have two studies that makes it more likely that you can claim that an acidic environment in the ground substance may probably enhance a stiffer, a more adhered, uh, more myofibroblast populated connective tissue and that would be a good argument to look at if you have an acidic environment in the ground substance, whether nutrition, whether meditation, whether moderate movement, I think that's the strongest influence, uh, may lower your uh, pro-inflammatory that usually goes along with an acidic environment, so whether you have a more neutral pH in the ground substance. Uh, before I close, also, you can see my excitement about all these new discoveries, which I think are useful for us in clinical practice. Because we overlooked fascia for so long, then now the excitement, uh, uh, similar like gold diggers, you look at any subject and you discover something new very easily, because nobody has looked there before. So that is the richness there. Um, uh, Professor Menze has looked at what does emotional stress do to myofascial sensitivity, and he put emotional stress on laboratory rats where he isolated them in a plastic container. So they don't get any pain, but they are about as you are sitting now. You, can, you are not allowed to get up because then your neighbor will be disturbed and the presenter may think you don't like his lecture. So you try to sit on the same position for one hour. I know you are suffering, so we have a coffee break soon, but the rats are suffering very much, or at least you can measure the suffering they have. So that is called mild emotional stress. And first of all, uh, you do that one hour only for 12 days, and then you look, is there anything different in them? And their eating is the same, their sleeping is the same, you don't see a difference. But if you measure them in the posterior horn of the spinal cord, where most of the sensory information comes into the central nervous system, there is an increased activity in those rats who had the emotional torture, mini torture, for 12 days before. And it stays for several weeks. Then they looked, is their uh, pain sensitivity different? So if you pinch them, there is no difference. If you do heat stimulation, there is no difference. But with pressure, there is an increased sensitivity in those rats who had the mild emotional stress that they have. So it means uh, normally you would have to push with half a kilogram or let's say a tenth of a kilogram before it hurts them. Now a fraction of that is sufficient and they start to scream. And it's not related to any tissue injury, it's related to mild emotional stress. Now this is very exciting because then emotional stress could, could lower the response, the sensitivity of myofascial tissues. Uh, this may fit together with a recent study from a former student of Professor Menze, Jonas Tessarts. He looked at low back pain patients, those who have chronic low back pain and no childhood abuse in their history, but also those who have a history of documented child abuse that happened 20 years before. And he looked, is the pain profile different? And he found exactly the same. Heat sensitivity is not different. Electrical sensitivity is not different. Pinching is not different. Uh, vibration is not different. However, pressure pain threshold is significantly, the threshold is diminished and the sensitivity is heightened in these people. So these are some intriguing uh, new findings. So if you have a client where not only in one or two places of the body, but on several places of the body, they seem to be sensitive towards your pressure. It could be a strong link between the autonomic nervous system uh, related to chronic mild uh, emotional stress and the sensitivity of the free nerve endings in the fascial system that they have in their body. 
So I look forward to my lecture, lecture this afternoon where I look at how does rolfing and yoga and movement therapy and osteopathy, for example, may have a beneficial effect on some of the pathologies that I was reporting to you. And finally, the slogan of our Muni group, fascia is a connecting tissue. And if you want to understand fascia, please become a good networker. Use this conference to share information with other people that you meet here, not only with the organizers. So use this day and the next day to become a very rich networker, ask your questions, share ideas, share flyers, and then you will continue to learn a lot. Thank you very much.